Welcome to The Power of the Cross. My name is Angelo Parker. And I'm Kamara Parker. We are the pastors of Faith Family Worship Center here in Southside, Richmond, Virginia. We'd like to take this opportunity, as always, to thank you for joining in and to invite you out to come fellowship with us. Our service times are on the screen. We would love to have you come out so we can meet you and, and enjoy the fellowship with like-minded believers. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, we are going to get started on a topic that we've been continuing. Uh, we started this probably last year sometime. I'm um, talking about uh, God and we went from talking about who is God to who is Jesus and now we're on who is the Holy Spirit and we've been doing this for the past few episodes and we're really going to delve into some more things about who is the Holy Spirit. The reason why we can we can delve into God more, yes, there's so many more things we can pull out about God, so many things we can pull out about Jesus um, and, and we can, those things, are, and all three of those including the Holy Spirit interact with one another. But the Holy Spirit is the active agent. He's the active participant in, the, in this world, what we see going on. And we'll explain more about that and talk about that more. But before we begin, we're going to open in prayer. Absolutely. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. And we give you all praise and glory and honor that's due unto you. We thank you for life and life more abundantly. We thank you for saving our souls. And we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to come in fellowship and to learn more about you. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And God, we thank you for divine direction on the day, and we're asking for your Holy Spirit to minister to us, to teach us and to unveil the truth of your gospel and the power of the cross to us. In everything we do, we give you all thanks and praise, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 So we've talked about several different things with the Holy Spirit. Not to recap um, everything that we talked about, but there's a, there are so many episodes that we've gone back and talked about the Holy Spirit. You can go on our YouTube channel at Faith Family Worship Center or FFWCRVA um, to see all of our past episodes, also to see our past services, our Wednesday night Bible study, our Sunday. Everything that we do is on that one page, and we would love for you to go out there and check those out, as well as the study that we've already begun in the Holy Spirit. Because he is key, he's crucial, Absolutely. and he is, as I said, the active agent in this world. And him being the active agent, we have to remember too, the Holy Spirit is God himself. Yes, he is. So it is God working in this earth, in the believer, working in the hearts and lives of people. Because the ultimate goal is for the Holy Spirit, by God's grace, is to save the very soul. Yes. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, how he works in us, he... His aim is to bring us to be more like Christ, mm -hmm. which Christ is God yes. himself, too. Yes. So the Holy Spirit in all aspects is working with the believer, with their heart, with their spirit, with the inner man, all, all aspects of the person to bring them to be more like Christ. You know, all of our previous episodes were titled, Who is the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. But I think more so going to, into this is how the Holy Spirit works. How the Holy Spirit, Spirit works in the believer. In the believer. Mm -hmm. Well, he works in all aspects of the world. And, yes. But specifically to the believer, he has a special relationship. He does. Because <clears throat> as the Holy Spirit, as we mentioned in the olden times, the Holy Spirit will come upon people in order for them to accomplish a certain task. But now he lives and dwells inside of the hearts of each and every single person that believes. Like J Jesus said in John, the Holy Spirit, he, he was with you, but now he will dwell in you. And he leads us and guides us into all truth. So that, that engagement, that active relationship with the Holy Spirit is evident. And I think it's most evident in a, in a particular scripture when we look at Romans chapter 8. Now, Romans chapter 8, I, I love the book of Romans in our Wednesday night Bible study. Yes. We are currently going through the book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter one right now. And we're taking our time to build the foundation of what Paul wrote to, um, in this letter. But it's so rich and it's so just full of information mm -hmm. that it's going to take us a while to get through it. We, we did it before and it took us two and a half years <laughs> yes. to get through it. Hopefully, well, as the Lord leads, it's going to take as long as he, as he decides for us to go through it. Absolutely. But Romans chapter eight is, is kind of the... The, the pinnacle of God's work and how the Holy Spirit really works in a believer. Now, I, wanted, I do want to kind of set the stage for a couple of things here. Um, there, are pe there are different thoughts as far as people in how the Holy Spirit really responds. We have a Pentecostal perspective and you have a non-Pentecostal perspective. And, and what does that mean? There's a, 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 the Pentecostal perspective means that the Holy Spirit is active. 
The Holy Spirit is an active participant to the point where there are gifts in the spirit that are revealed to men, as, as said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14. Those gifts are operative and they're going on. And you may, may have heard the term charismatic. Um, that means the gifts of the spirit are actually working in this present time which we are Pentecostal and we strongly believe and know for assurance, I just believe we know for assurance that the Holy Spirit is still acting in this way. Absolutely. So, but then there's also a group of, of people who believe that the working of the Holy Spirit in those aspects ended when the Bible was completed, when the canon of scripture was completed, when those times of the early church were complete. Now, those are called cessationists. Mm -hmm. They believe the actions of the Holy Spirit stopped. But when we look at those two perspectives, I really believe that, well, I know that there's some charismatics that have gone way over to the right and gone way to the, to the, to the side of, of heresy and lunacy that's going on. And you see those things. And there's some cessationists who are so staunch against the working of the Holy Spirit, they deny almost to the, I'm not want to say to the point of blasphemy, but they deny the activity of the Holy Spirit and attribute it to just happenstance or circumstance right um you, know, you, you want to say something else? I, yeah. I do i want to say this too because because we have the far to the right and then we have the other position far and there is no true understanding that really what the holy spirit is it's it is christ jesus mm -hmm. living on the inside of us mm -hmm. and all the work that he does he's not there to control mm -hmm. and he did not stop producing what needs to be produced in absolutely us. And what ends up happening is that either we feel like we're doing things that the Holy Spirit controls, and if, and if we don't have the control of the Holy Spirit, then we, we don't do it. But yeah. that's not what the Holy Spirit aims to do. When he, what, he, all, what he's aiming to do is, like I've said over and over again, is to make us more like Christ. Yes. But it begins with our faith in what Jesus accomplished at the cross. Mm -hmm. And from that, the Holy Spirit teaches us mm -hmm. how he can operate in our lives. Yes. So he hasn't stopped producing the fruit of the Spirit, no. the acts that we see, you know, the gifts of the, the, Spirit. Gifts of the yep. Spirit. He hasn't stopped producing those things, and those things are still to be abundant even yes. more so, especially in the times that we live in now. But also what he's trying to do is that each day he's trying to get us to realize that, yes, you can be like Christ if you keep your faith in Christ, but you can do the things like Jesus did and do greater works than he did because you have a longer time and you have the spirit of Jesus living on the inside of you. And there are more people with the presence of God dwelling on the inside. Absolutely. So you do greater things. I do greater things. You do greater things. And all those greater things are to give glory to God. You know, I, I, I want to say this as far as the, the far extreme side of charis, um, charismatic behavior and Pentecostal behavior. You know, they make everything so spiritual. Yes. It, 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 it turns it, into witchcraft almost. Well, or lunacy. Well, that's what the part about controlling. Yeah. And so you see and I, these. I was going to say lack of control. Exactly. Yes. You see lack of control <laughs> yep. because they think the Holy Spirit is controlling, but the Holy Spirit is not. Mm -mm. He's not in chaos and he's not in confusion. He is not in any confusion. What it says there is confusion. There's every evil work. And I don't care what you say, you know, different perspectives. And I'm not here to argue that perspective, but I'm here to tell you that there is a truth in what the Bible says. Now, as a believer, as someone who is, is required, and I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about you. You're required to find out the truth of the gospel for yourself. Absolutely. You're required, look, even what we're telling you, go to the Bible and read it for yourself. And to get an understanding, ask, because this is what you can do. Yes. And the Holy Spirit does this. He brings you into the knowledge of all truth. You can ask God to show me what the truth is. Mm -hmm. And he will show you, he will lead you into all truth. The spirit of truth leads you into all truth. Absolutely. And so we got we to gotta understand that we're responsible for how we live this life. We're responsible in, in, in working out our own salvation, not deciding whether Jesus Christ is Lord or not. That's already decided. But what we have to understand is how we build on the foundation of Christ and him crucified is crucial because you can be in the flesh and think that you're working in the spirit. Absolutely. And we're gonna talk about that here in Romans chapter eight. And it's so, it's so crucial for us to understand. So um, let's just get into Romans chapter eight and start talking and, uh, and see what the Lord has to say about the uh, life in the spirit. So we're beginning at Romans chapter eight, verse one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus 
has made me free from the law of sin and death. And we're going to pause right there and take those two verses because <clears throat> they're meaty enough as they are. They are very much so. So we look at this and we see what, what Paul is saying. He's He's brought us through the fact, and just to give you a, a quick synopsis of the book of, of Romans, um, he starts off in, in the first three chapters and says that all men are guilty before God. It doesn't make a difference whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you're guilty before God. A man that was created that didn't know God was guilty before God. You were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. You were guilty before God. But then in chapter three, it turns, um, three through um, five, Ish. In the end of five, it turns to justification, mm -hmm. which, allow, which lets us know that now you're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. There is, there is now no, you know, you, you are now made right in the eyes of God. On previous episodes, we've said this, and I will continue to say it because this is what we believe, and this is how the Bible bears it out, is that justification means that you are in, in right standing with God. It's just as if you never sinned mm -hmm. because you are in Christ Jesus. Your faith is in Christ Jesus. So God sees you as he sees Jesus Christ, justified. He sees Jesus Christ was sinless, and he gave us his sinless life in, in exchange for our sinful life. He died a death that he did not deserve in order to pay the price for us, which was death. Absolutely. And so he gave us life while he took death. So we look at this, and then when he's talking about justification, he, he goes in, in that in the chapter 5, and then he starts going into the process of sanctification. Absolutely. Which starts in chapter in the chapter 5 and goes into chapter 6, 7, and 8, eight. And where mm -hmm. we are right now. Because when you read chapter 6, Paul lays out a bunch of things talking about, um, don't you know? He lays out about six things saying, don't you know that those who are, who are dead to Christ, they were, they, were, they were crucified with Christ. They are dead to the sin nature. Absolutely. They are dead to sin. They were buried with him. They were risen with him to a newness of life. This is what you have to know. Don't you know that sin no longer has dominion over you? Mm -hmm. The sin nature no longer rules and reigns over you. But now, you know, and it goes into chapter 7 and it talks about more as far as like, okay, now, now that I, I'm in Christ Jesus, if I try to live a life according to law, I will fall back into sin. The sin nature will take over. The sin nature will reign. The sin nature will rule. And as Paul said, sin revived. Yes. And I died. Absolutely. And so when we get there, now we're at chapter 8, as Paul says, you know, he went to that old wretched man that I am moment. You know, who shall deliver me from this body of death? It says, I thank God that through my Savior, Jesus Christ. It's at verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And so he lays down some spiritual laws. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about here in Romans chapter 8 is really the two most prominent spiritual laws that we, we experience. The law of the, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death. So how, how these two work. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus means that this is how we as new Christians or believers, we are baptized into Christ. We live our life now with the victory that Jesus Christ has afforded us. Mm -hmm. We live in that way because the victory that he's afforded us was because we are no longer uh, alive to sin, but we're dead to the sin nature ruling us. What this law provides is the only way we can receive victory in our lives is through our faith in Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished at the cross. Yes. This means that we are alive in Christ. Mm -hmm. We are no longer bound and uh, the sin nature doesn't rule in us and have dominion over us anymore if our faith is in Jesus Christ. Yes. And we live our life in that, knowing that. The law of sin and death, however, mm -hmm. which is what we were all bound by before. Every single person. Sin ruled as a king in our life. We were subject to it mm -hmm. and we were, um, since we were subject to it, the only way that we, only reward we had was death. Yes. And that meant that as a sinner and sin nature ruling in us, we would no longer be able to have freedom in our life if we lived according to sin. You know, Paul lays out that the wages of sin is death. Yes. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's really what we're, what we're preaching to you. You know, we are, we've moved from one kingdom to another kingdom. We moved from the devil's kingdom into the kingdom of God. And as a, as a, and being in a new kingdom, being a new creation, we need to know the, the laws and the rules that apply to us in that kingdom. We were ruled, as you said, by the law of sin and death. But we're a little bit ahead of ourselves because we're in chapter two. So, but now we are ruled by the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. 
So going back and looking at this, first off, it starts off, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those which, to them which are in Christ Jesus. So let's talk about this word condemnation for a second. The word condemnation, we look at it and people throw this word around very lightly. Condemnation is not the fact that you, of you feeling guilty. Condemnation is the fact of the sentence that you receive because you are guilty of the crime. You can get you can get convicted of a crime, but then when you're sentenced to the to life or whatever the, the, the penalty is for it, then you're condemned to that penalty. And in this instance, the penalty is death for sin. So can I add something you sure to can. this? So I like this when we when we talked about the difference between conviction mm -hmm. and condemnation. So condemnation is the judgment you receive when you don't adhere to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. I know that might sound tricky, but we always use conviction because we think conviction is the actual sentencing. No, condemnation is the sentencing. Mm -hmm. When you don't follow, you don't realize that the Holy Spirit, his, one of his uh, jobs and responsibilities is to show us what is sin, and especially what is sin within us, and where we are not following according to the dictates of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit convicts. He shows us that this is what causes us to be separated from God. Mm -hmm. And it's up to us that once we feel this conviction, we turn we back, respond, yes. we respond, we don't go that way, um, follow that path, but rather we turn, repent, mm -hmm. and go another direction. Because if we don't repent, what's down the line for us is condemnation, yep. which is judgment. And, and that final judgment is eternal death and separation from God. But if we, this is what it says, let's go back to the scripture. There is therefore now no condemnation. That means no sentence of being guilty, no, no judgment of guilty as far as now the penalty is, is required uh, to them which are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. If you are in Christ Jesus, and Paul uses this variation of the word in Christ Jesus in multiple times, being in Christ Jesus means this, that you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Now, Savior means one thing, means he saved me and forgive me of my sins. But Lord means something else. Lord means now he rules and reigns in my life. Absolutely. Whereas the devil was the king, yes, and the devil what is the king of anybody who is an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. I don't care what they say. The devil is the king of anybody who is an unbeliever because they are in his, in his kingdom. Absolutely. And he is the ruler of the kingdom of this world. But when we've been transformed into this new world, we've been transplanted from the old kingdom into the kingdom of life, we now have a new ruler. Absolutely. And since we have this new ruler now, Jesus is our king. Mm -hmm. And since he's our king, now he rules and reigns. And that's what it means to be in Christ Jesus. In the realm, in the sphere, in the kingdom, in the... In the uh, fellowship of and mm -hmm. in the in the faith of all these things that we see in Christ Jesus you need to be in Christ Jesus there's no other place and if you're a believer if you said yes to Jesus Christ as your savior if you're born again then you are in the kingdom but now you have to know how to live for God now you have to know the processes that you have to go through in order for you to be a victorious Christian as opposed to a just getting by Christian or an apathetic Christian or a weak emaciated Christian. Absolutely. And this is exactly what the Holy Spirit, he comes to do. Mm -hmm. He comes to live in the believer so that he can teach you and he can guide you yes. how to live because now you have a new life. Yes. You're no longer, uh, you're no longer ruled by the dictates of this world. Mm -hmm. You're no longer ruled by the dictates of the sin nature mm -hmm. you're no longer ruled and influenced by the devil mm -hmm. you now should be living a life according to the spirit yes and so this for believers is a new thing yes but it's a good thing because in Christ Jesus if you keep your faith in Christ Jesus and you realize that he is your source mm -hmm. And you realize that everything you you will receive from God comes from the fact that he gave his very life mm -hmm. and you are no longer bound mm -hmm. by that old nature. The Holy Spirit works in you. You know, you use the word and I meant to get back to this word and I forgot, but I'm gonna get back to it now. Power, you used the word earlier, mm -hmm. right? So when you are under the, the subject of the devil, you're under his power, you're under his influence. But God has taken you and now he's giving you power to live him. And what we see in this church and what we see in the body of Christ right now 
is a, a group of people who, who acknowledge God, but they deny the very power thereof. And when you deny the power of God, what you end up doing is you end up living for God by your own efforts, living for God by your own works. No power of the Holy Spirit, no authority of the Holy, Holy Spirit, because power is defined in two words. It is, is, is dunamis and it's exousian. Dunamis is the very power that is like the gas that drives the car. Exousian is like the license that allows you to drive the car. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that we have power and authority. We have the power to live the life that God has called us to live through the working of the Holy Spirit in us. We have the knowledge and the ability, not by our own ability, but by the power of the Holy Spirit who, who is taking us down this path of faith as we walk, mm -hmm. as we yield ourselves. But then we also have the authority given to us by Jesus Christ to, to tread over those demons and those devils and those obstacles and those hindrances that are coming our way and, and try to take it from us and say, hey, you know, you can't overcome this. You're not victorious in this. In the, in the name of Jesus, yes, I am. Yes, Jesus I am. died to give you victory. Absolutely. He died that you could have overcoming power. He died that you may have life and have life more abundantly. You're not subject to anything. I don't care what this world says. You're not subject to the things of this world. Yeah, you may be influenced and they may have a hold on you, but they do not have power over you. Walk in what God has provided for you. I'm, I'm way ahead of myself, but, but we're it, here. It we're happens here. that sometimes, you know, I know we keep referring to the world, mm -hmm. and I, I want you to understand, as believers, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Mm -hmm. What that means is, is this, that this world system and its dictates how it operates. Yes. The world system, what it requires is more selfishness and ambition mm -hmm. and pleasing of yes. self than, uh, than what should be allowed. Mm -hmm. God did not create us for us to worship ourselves and for our world system to be centered around us. A lot of people don't want to hear that because it's all about, I, I believe what I can do and what I can accomplish. But this world system teaches us opposite of uh, what God wants. God wants us to worship him, to be in fellowship with him. Mm -hmm. And so we, before, when we were talking about being in the world system and the Holy Spirit has, you know, separated us from that because we're now in Christ Jesus. We are no longer dictated by, and we, which we mean we're no longer ruled by this selfish ambition and pleasing ourselves. We are no longer the center anymore. Jesus Christ Jesus center. is the center. Yes, he is. And the Holy Spirit works from there. Yes. So that's when we say that all the time about this world. And so you understand, we're not talking about, oh, now you, you're in the world, but you don't have to obey the laws of the government. You don't have. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about how this world system dictates how we respond. We no longer respond to pleasing ourselves and doing what we want to do, but rather what God wants to do in us. You know, we don't have a whole lot of time. I think we're laying out a good foundation for oh, this segment. Realize, realize that we we film in, in chunks. So if you're here, you're at the beginning of a, of a chunk of, of a few episodes. Um, so you need to stay and, and you need to catch the next one because we're going to build on this from there. We are. But, you know, you, you talked about the world. And I, and I think I, I want to lay this out real quick with just a little bit of time that we have left. You know, there, there are certain agents of sin. Mm -hmm. So what I mean an agent. So just like the Holy Spirit is the agent of God, the devil has his agents as well. And those agents do his bidding. And before you were saved, and I'm going to just see, I'm just say this, not even before you were saved, there are agents of sin, which are the world, as my wife spoke about, mm -hmm. the flesh, which we're going to talk about here right now um, in Romans chapter 8, and the devil himself. Mm -hmm. You know, the world is the world system. You know, the, the flesh is everything that we are without the Holy Spirit. I will elaborate on that some yes. more probably, not in this episode, but probably just a little bit in the next episode, so you need to tune in. But then the devil, the devil is the puppet master that's orchestrating everything to draw us away from the truth of the gospel. He's the one that's, that's putting uh, blind spots in our own minds. Oh, yes. He builds up hindrances. He, he allows people to come at us and, and make us think certain ways about people of God, make us think certain ways. You, you can look, and I'm, I'm interrupting myself, but you can look at the fact of what's going on in the churches themselves. You can look at the, the hypocrisy and the heresy that's going on in the churches themselves, the, 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 the lasciviousness and, the, and, the, and all just every evil work. Pastors who are drawing people to themselves, pastors who aren't preaching the gospel, pastors who are watering down the gospel to the point where people leave here, leave the church and think that they're okay when God tells you to come into the hospital because you're sick and to come get the medicine to make you feel well. 
So the devil is in operation of where there's confusion. He's in operation where there's any false doctrine. He's in operation where there's anything that turns you away from the truth of the gospel. So, so we have to understand as, as, as pastors ourselves, we need to bring you to the green pastures. Yes. We need to lead you beside the still waters yes. so that your soul can be restored. And that's the purpose of, of, the, of this power of the cross. That's the purpose of our ministry. That's the yes. purpose on what we do. That's the purpose of a truly called um, minister of the gospel. And this is another aspect of, of being a, a called minister. If you are a believer, you are called to be a minister. Yes. You are called to administer the gospel. You have the prescription for people to get well. Oh, yeah. You have the prescription for healing of their souls. You have the prescription for the healing of the separation between them and God, the enmity that they have between them and God. You have the gospel. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel right. because it is the very power of God to those who believe, to everyone who believes. And what we have in this church, just to get back to that point, is we have people who have a form of godliness, but deny the very power thereof. We have to stop denying the power of God. We have to, have to stop denying what God is, is doing as far as what his word says, what the Holy Spirit does. And we need to come together as one body, as one church, under the truth of the, of the message of the, of the cross, the true power of the cross that God provided for us through the Bible, and, and let our eyes not be clouded by our own philosophical thinking. You know, we are going to have to wrap up uh, this episode and just remember that we are speaking about the Holy Spirit's work yes. in the believer. We would love for you to come back and tune in with us. Uh, we're going to be a little while in Romans, the eighth chapter, just talking about how as believers, you know, how we should walk and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in this, this order of victory that God has set forth. So what we do, we're going to end this episode in prayer. If you uh, please join with us right at this moment. Mm -hmm. Father God, in the name of Jesus, you, Jesus, we give you praise and we give you glory now. And we thank you, Father. We thank you for opening up our eyes of understanding, Lord, and that how, allowing the Holy Spirit to pour wisdom into our hearts, Father, so that we can see and know you, Lord. You, Father, Jesus. it is so very important that as yes, we Lord. study the word of God, that you reveal the truth of the gospel, reveal our victory through Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished at the cross. And I thank you, Father, for opening our eyes. I thank you, Lord, for anointing this time and even anointing those that are in their homes right now, Lord. I thank you, God, for bringing us closer to yes, you. Lord. In your name we pray and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Power of the Cross. God bless you. ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because what matters to God is my faith. Faith Family Worship Center, 2420 Weber Street, Richmond.